today, and Exodus, and Corinthians, but we'll start in Matthew. For the past few weeks, we've been looking at uh, parts of the Ten Commandments that are found in the book of Exodus, and uh, so this morning we're going to jump forward, and we're going to look at the two great commandments that Jesus gave in the book of Matthew, chapter 22. this uh, series up next Sunday, and then Cassie and I will be gone the following weekend. Matthew 22, verse uh, 37. Well, let's do 34. We'll be right back up. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And I could just see this expert smirk on his face. Oh, look at this. All right, we got it now. We got it now. And Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's a very important line right there. There are 613 laws in the Torah. The book of Moses, the law, the books of law. 600. Thirteen commands. Now, we always emphasize the Ten Commandments. It's a pretty easy condense. It's a list. The other six, 603 are spread out throughout the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. 613 laws. And when Jesus says, and the law and the prophets hang on these two commands, Jesus is saying that the root of every law, every command, points back to either loving God or loving your neighbor. Love is the root of the law. Love is at the heart of every command. Let's go back to Exodus now and look at the Ten Commandments real quick. <coughs> you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number one. Why? Commandment number two. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. Skipping down a little bit. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I love that. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only line I have highlighted in all the Ten Commandments. The Lord your God, I am a jealous God. Because what that tells me is that God loves us so much that when we turn to an idol, when we turn to something else, he becomes jealous of that idol. He becomes jealous of the money. He becomes jealous of whatever it is that takes his place. He's a jealous God. That's how much he loves me. Have you ever felt that kind of jealousy before? I remember when I was a senior in high school, maybe, right out of high school, uh, my first serious girlfriend. Um, <laughs> Okay, we dated a year and a half. A year and a half. And out of the blue one day, she said, I think, I think we're done. I think we're done. She gave me back her ring. Oh, man, I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. And I would stalk, I stalked her for a few days. I'd follow her to work. I'd sit outside where she worked. And I remember one time I was sitting outside where she worked, and, and she was coming out, and I got out of the car, and, and you know, I confronted her, and we went back and forth, and I took the ring that she had given me back, and I threw it. And, I mean, I was just hurt. I didn't, she's back. <clears throat> I didn't even go away. Jealous. I mean, I, I, you know, and, that, and to me, that's how God feels. Uh, when I break up with him, when I choose something or someone else over him. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Remember the Sabbath. You do these things because you love God. And then we switch, honor your father. 
father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cut your neighbor's wife, uh, yeah, neighbor's wife or house. Or it's love. Why? Because we love. We're supposed to love our neighbors. And when you love someone, you don't do these things. I read a story about a man who was, I think he was walking, uh, and he was coming to a bridge, and he saw another man on the edge of this bridge getting ready to jump. And so he yells, he says, stop, stop, don't jump. And the man said, well, why not? What do I have to live for? And the other guy said, what do you have to live for? Are you religious? And the guy said, yes. Well, so am I. Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? I'm a Protestant. Me too, he says. Are you, are you Baptist? Are you Methodist? Are you a disciple? He said, I'm a disciple. I am too. Do you have communion at the middle of the service or at the end? So we have communion at the end of the service. At the end, are you crazy or heretic? You pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> now this slightly amusing story captures a sad truth, and that is that it's the simplest things that can cause division within the body of Christ. Why do we insist on pushing people away? When Jesus clearly prays that we are one. Not just one as a church, one as the body. Being all Christians, all believers. This is why it rubs me personally the wrong, wrong, uh, the wrong way. I think it rubs some of you the wrong way. When I see or hear somebody standing on their soapbox condemning everybody that walks by. You're going to go to hell because you don't believe the same way I believe. Shortly following my spiritual reawakening, I was visited by a, a, a Christian who wanted to make sure I was headed down the right path. And at first I was like, absolutely, I'm a baby Christian? Absolutely. And this person came over me. But it quickly became apparent that his only objective was to let me know that if I didn't believe the way he believed and his church believed, that I was doomed to hell. It was a very disillusioning moment for me that a fellow believer would take advantage of a new believer like that. And if you look at the ministry of Jesus, you're going to see that Jesus was, you know, he, if you want to use the word judge, he was one who would acknowledge, identify a person's sin. You see that all throughout. Sin, sin, sin. But at the same time, Jesus always offered a path to redemption. He didn't condemn. He, just, he didn't just condemn. He offered a path of redemption. He spoke tough words, but he always left the door open for redemption. And the church today is so quick to pronounce judgment. The church of today is so quick to condemn, and yet they're slow to offer forgiveness. They're slow to extend acceptance. They're slow to even offer genuine love. To their neighbor. Matthew 22. This is where it begins, right here. It begins with love. That's the root of every law and every command. I read the story about a little girl who had a doll, and she carried that doll with her everywhere she went. She held it tight, she kissed it, she hugged it, she loved that doll. And one day her mother looked at her and said, You really love your she said, yes, Mama, I love my doll. But she doesn't love me back. And I think we get into our finite minds, we get into that, that idea that, that when we come to church and because we serve on a committee, because we sing in the choir, that all of these things add up to us loving God enough. But the truth is we could never, never love God enough. Ever. God, our heavenly creator, our redeemer, the one who loved us even when we rejected him, deserves far more love than we could ever show him. And yet while all of these things, serving the committees and, and singing in the choir and, and doing all these things are manifestations of the love that we have for God, we must never come to that point in our spiritual life where we embrace the idea of, well, I do enough things 
So that's enough for me to show uh, to show God I love him. He knows I love him because I serve on here and I serve here. We can never love God enough. We should love nobody or nothing more than we love God. And if we love God, then our love for others will grow out of that even more. C.S. Lewis, author C.S. Lewis said, When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. When it comes to love, we do have to show it. It's an expression, a manifestation of the love that we have received from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. We all know it, I think. We're all familiar with it. First Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Its love never fails. And what I love about these few verses is love, the way it's used here, is an action word. And I read one commentator's writing on this and where he takes where it says love does not, love does not, love does not, he changes that by putting in the opposite. And it was a really powerful thing to see. To change those does nots into does. So instead of love does not envy, or let's, let's say love is not proud, uh, it would be love is humble. Love is humble. Uh, love is not self-seeking would be uh, love is about serving others. I can't remember what exactly he wrote. But he put the opposites in there, which made that a very a, a more powerful uh, uh, a thing to see. And if you look at these words, you'll see that they are words that are proactive. These are things that we are supposed to be doing. Not sitting back waiting for, for Uncle Joe to show us these things. We are to be doing these as Christians. We are to be putting love into action the way they're presented here in 13. I read where the daughter of the founder of the uh, Salvation Army, one time she was in, uh, I think it was a, a slum area, um, and she was cleaning the wounds of a drunk lady, a lady who had uh, passed out and she was cleaning her wounds. And the friend of this uh, daughter, of the founder of Salvation Army, she said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the daughter said, neither would I. We love because God first loved us. And as Christians, we should all continue to allow God to enable us to become better at the love. Now, love has its risks. There are always risks when it comes to love. When we choose to love, we are putting ourselves in a position of being hurt, being rejected, being taken advantage of. But having faith means taking that risk. Not being like the rest of the world, which tends to be filled with a lot of hatred right now, a lot of anger, a lot of negativity. Allowing God's love to flow through us involves risk, but it also brings joy, an ultimate joy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, but Pastor Kurt, there's no way I could love my neighbor. You don't know what she has done to me. I don't even like her sitting next to me in this pew. There's no way I could love my neighbor. You, you may not be able to love her, but God's love in you can. God's love in you can. God's love is stronger than any hatred. 
any fear, any sin. All you've got to do is open yourself up to it. Lift that cup and allow him to fill it. So I invite you to meditate, to reflect on that this morning. Our closing hymn is Room at the Cross for You, number 381. You know, there's always room. Our human, our human mind, we tend to project those things onto God and onto our relationship with God. And, you know, if, if we come from an environment or come from a home or come from a place where we always feel like we're a burden on others, that uh, you know, that's the way we're going we're to project that onto God. And we're going to think, well, God doesn't want to hear us. God doesn't need my problems. He's got enough things to deal with. But this hymn tells us all we need to know that there is room at the cross for you. It doesn't matter where you're at in your journey. It doesn't matter what you've been through, what you're going through. It doesn't matter. There's always room at the cross. And Christ invites you to bring whatever it is that you have to room at the cross for you. Number 381. We'll sing verse 1 as we stand together this morning and as we praise